This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good evening, Tampa Bay, and those that are listening online streaming. And I know you're listening because I get the emails, and I really appreciate it. And welcome to this evening's show. And I hope you enjoy today's topic as much as I do. Now, of course, as regular listeners know, I have a great love of parasitology. And uh, today we'll be discussing the ins and outs of a not very well-known but very dangerous roundworm called Bayless Ascaris. And I am thrilled to have um, what I consider the ultimate authority on the raccoon roundworm. Um, joining me now is Kevin Kazakos. DVM, Ph.D. Dr. Kazakos is a professor emeritus of veterinary parasitology at Purdue University, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Kazakos, welcome, sir, to the program. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. This is actually quite a thrill. This is one of the more interesting parasites um, that I enjoy reading about. It's something, of course, I don't see in the laboratory, but... Uh, let's go ahead and start to give my audience, which I would imagine a big chunk, uh, do not know much about Bayless Ascaris. So let's start with an introductory summary for my audience about the raccoon roundworm, Bayless Ascaris procyonis, uh, before we delve into the more juicy details. Okay. Well, it's a so-called raccoon roundworm. It's a very common uh, large ascarid parasite that raccoons carry. Um and uh, it's come to notoriety because its larvae migrate in other animals, including humans, and cause disease. Yeah, and some very, very frightening disease at that. Now, is this related to other roundworms, like um, the roundworm that's found in dogs and cats known as Toxicara and Ascaris that humans get all over the planet? Yes, it's in the same group and uh, closely related to both of those. So it's it's very similar. So if people are familiar with those parasites, uh, this one is similar. Okay. Now, let's start with a little geography. So where is Bayless Ascaris procyonis found? Well, it occurs in raccoons primarily in North America, and in North America it's most common in populations in the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, and on the West Coast. Um, as you get into the deep south, down here into Florida, it's a uh, much lower prevalence, but still present. But it also occurs in uh, other countries. It's, uh, the raccoon was actually introduced into Europe for its uh, fur, in, into the Soviet Union, actually, in Germany. And so now we have Bayless Ascaris present in Europe. It's also present in Japan because of the introduction of a lot of pet raccoons, uh, exotic pets. And uh, it's also present in China, of all places, uh, because they've got raccoons in their zoos over there. Now, as far as Florida goes, um, of course, the show uh, is from Tampa. Um, it's a pretty recent occurrence, though, that uh, Bayless Ascaris has been found in, in this part of the country. Absolutely. Uh, we didn't previously didn't really think it occurred in Florida. Uh, the furthest it was found into the southeast was in northern Georgia. But then, uh, and there were some pretty good surveys done in Florida. But recently it was found in raccoons up in the panhandle of Florida and in Hillsborough County and over near um, Miami and in that area. So um, it does occur here now at a low prevalence. We don't exactly know why. Like maybe there was a translocation of raccoons by people or possibly an infected dog brought it in, something like that. Okay, so that's, that makes this show even that more important since we are in Hillsborough County, and mm-hmm. um, this is a great um, great education for me and my audience. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Bayless Ascaris procyonis is specific for raccoons, uh, where they the raccoons serve as a definitive host as opposed to a paratenic host like mice and birds. Um, but there are other strains found in other mammals. Um, to give my audience a feel for what we're talking about, can you define the difference between a definitive host 
and a peritonic host. And can you talk a little bit about the life cycle of Bayless Ascaris in the raccoon as opposed to um, a human, for example? Okay. Um, well, a definitive host is where the a parasite reaches adulthood. So that's where we see the adult roundworms, the males and females, and reproduction takes place. And then they're going to shed eggs, and those eggs are passed in the, the feces or the stool of the raccoon. They develop outside, like uh, other ascarid eggs would, and reach an infective stage larva. And then that those eggs then are very resistant and just kind of sit out in the environment waiting to be accidentally eaten by another animal. This is where the peritonic host comes in because a wide variety of other species uh, who ingest these eggs, those eggs will hatch and the larvae will penetrate into their tissues and undergo migration. And uh, their goal is to get out into the tissues of that peritonic host and then become encapsulated and remain essentially for the life of that host until it's accidentally uh, or purposely eaten by a raccoon, either by scavenging or or predation, and then the life cycle is completed. And we we know now also that uh, raccoons become infected not only by eating peritonic hosts carrying larvae, but young raccoons can be infected directly from ingestion of the eggs. And that's actually probably more important for maintaining it in uh, the raccoon population. Okay. Now, um, and this is something I just learned. I, I read this USGS mono, monograph um, concerning Bayless Ascaris, and it was incredibly interesting. Um, but there are other strains um, mm-hmm. that are found in everything from skunks to Tasmanian devils. Um, yeah, Bayless Ascaris, actually, uh, the genus was... Um, erected in 1968 to, to include all these related species, and they're actually species. So there's a species in, in several other um, lower carnivores. So there's one that occurs in skunks and other mustelids. There's one in weasels. Uh, there's one uh, in bears. It's very common in zoo bears, for example. And there's one in um, Tasmanian devils of all animals and uh um, so there's these other species out there. There's actually one that occurs in badgers. So we, we have about a eight or eight or nine other species besides Procyonus. Yeah. So so for the raccoons and the skunks and, and, and the rest of the of the different mammals, um the definitive host, does Bayless Ascaris cause any disease in the definitive host? Not really, because it doesn't really migrate Um, very much in those animals. As far as we know, it pretty much developed in the intestine. It might go into the wall of the intestine and then come back out. Um, So it really doesn't undergo the larval migration and produce that type of a problem as it would in a peritonic host. However, um, we do see occasional disease in raccoons and other animals, and it's related to the adult. It's actually if they have a very heavy infection of the adults, that can uh, hurt them by uh, uh, impaction of the intestine or something like that. Oh, okay, so much in the same way that um, Ascaris lumbricoides would do to a human being. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, now, I read in in, in the uh, USGS document that um, uh, Bayless Ascaris procyonis is more pathogenic than the other species. Um, mm-hmm. Why is that? Um, that, it's not really, really well known, but there, the theory out there is, um, because raccoons are not very strong carnivores like some of the other species are, and they're more opportunistic, then basically this has evolved to become very pathogenic in the peritonic host, because if it affects those peritonic hosts and they can't function properly, then they're more easier targets for predation by raccoons. And so a raccoon will certainly eat other animals if it can catch them and if it can happen on them. And what's better than for them to happen on uh, small animals that are affected, their nervous system's affected, and they can't function properly, so they're easily caught. And so that's why we kind of think the more pathogenic ones uh, have have evolved that way. Okay, let's talk uh, more specifically about the... Bayless Ascaris egg, which is the infective stage. That's how me or you could become infected. 
Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, it's it's pretty resistant. Um, how resistant is it? I mean, if it's out in your yard and if there's if there's a latrine, which I'm gonna we're gonna talk about in a little bit, mm-hmm. how long would that egg survive in the environment? Well, asteroid eggs in general are some of the most resistant transmission stages of any organism, and um, they basically can survive for years in the soil. And uh, we've kept Bayless asteroid eggs in the refrigerator uh, in 1% formaldehyde in the refrigerator for 12 years, and they were still infective. Oh, my gosh. So they'll actually survive uh, out in the environment um, until they dry out and become desiccated. I guess that would be their worst enemy. But if they're in soil that periodically gets rain, uh, they're easily going to last five or six years and, and, and maybe longer. Right. Now, um, how about the, the common disinfectant that most people are familiar with, bleach? Is bleach effective mm-hmm. on the egg? It will not kill the eggs. Um, what bleach does is remove the outer protein coat of asteroid eggs, which makes them less sticky, and you can wash them away. But it really doesn't kill the eggs. And uh, when we talk about disinfecting and killing the eggs, we have to use more stringent methods, like uh, some form of heat is usually the best way. Right. Now, on that same topic, though, because of the bleach resistance, if uh, hypothetical um, raccoon feces got into a water supply, Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that there's a, that would be a danger? Um, possibly. If it was fresh raccoon feces, the eggs need oxygen to develop to the infective stage. So um, we've dealt with that somewhat in, uh, say, people's swimming pools and such, where uh, the eggs probably aren't going to develop unless they get a really high concentration of oxygen. Um and and also, if they're in a pool, they're going to be filtered out by some sort of filtration sure. apparatus and that sort of thing. So um, they really need that oxygen to develop. Now, now you're talking about there's a period of time in between uh, the form the formation or the excretion of the egg and the time that it's actually infective. So there's a period of time before it's actually can cause yeah. disease, right? How long is that? Exactly. Um, about two weeks under optimal conditions. If you if you give them optimal temperature and humidity, they will make it because they're they're developing from the one cell stage, and that that egg is fertilized, and that one cell has to develop like any other organism all the way up and develop a, a first stage larva, and that larva molts in the egg a couple times and eventually forms a third stage larva, and that takes about two weeks okay. under optimal conditions. Um, say you're in the Midwest, however, and it's like fluctuating temperatures, it may take uh, a month or six weeks for them to reach the infective stage. So it depends on temperature. Okay. Now, the other important thing other than its resistance is concerning the eggs is the massive numbers that are produced um, each time a raccoon defecates. Um, so how, how many eggs per gram of feces are found in, 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 in a raccoon, um, uh, defecation for lack of a better uh, term? <laughs> it, it's, it's actually astounding. Um, these asteroids are, are large and their, their entire goal for the females is to produce, to produce eggs so that they can, disseminate and be transmitted. So she actually puts out an estimate between 100,000 to 200,000 eggs per day per female worm. So what if you have 40 female worms in that raccoon or something? You're you're producing a lot of eggs. So the average raccoon we've found is shedding about 26,000 eggs per gram of feces, but we've seen them... uh, uh, easily shedding over a hundred thousand gram uh, per gram, and a gram of feces is not very much. It's right. like the size of your little fingernail. Right. The highest I've ever seen was in a actually a pet raccoon. People had a young one. It was shedding over a quarter of a million eggs per gram of feces, what? and you can see at those rates, it really doesn't take very much time for massive contamination to take place. 
you know, it, with, with this mass quantity of eggs and children playing in the backyards, it's, it's astounding. We have, we're going to talk about human infections later, but it's astounding that there's been so few documented cases. Um, well, we have to separate, and we'll get to that later. We have to separate actual infection from clinical disease. Sure. And um, so that's probably the separator there, recognition. Yeah. Right. Okay, we, you, you talked briefly about um, uh, the way the raccoons... Uh, uh, contract the parasite, and mm-hmm. uh, in one way is the how the young uh, tr- um, pick up the eggs. Is this what through the teats or through the fur of the mother, or how does that work? Uh, actually, it's uh, contamination probably around the den, like the den tree, or when they're old enough and they leave the the den tree with their mother, she'll take them to and show them what's called a raccoon latrine which is like a communal defecation site that raccoons use. Uh, Those in an area will use common sites for defecation. We think it might be a a form of communication. Um, And so when, you know, those sites then become contaminated with eggs and contain infected eggs, when those baby raccoons contact them, they can become infected by by licking or contamination to their feet and then grooming themselves. They probably also pick up some infection directly from their mother's fur or her teats just from contamination. Right, right. But the eggs have to be ingested. Right. Now, there's there's uh, scores of mammals, including humans and, and birds. I mean, I, I think I saw about 150 different species so far. Yeah, so far, right. That have been documented as being infected by Bayless Ascaris. Um, yep. So how does the average mouse or squirrel or rabbit or uh, um, bird uh, contract this lethal parasite? Because it's, it's usually lethal for them. Well, what's, what we found is in, in nature, there's a tremendous amount of activity uh, around raccoon latrines because raccoon feces contains all the seed material from whatever the raccoons were eating. And when that feces dries out, the, that area becomes heavily laden with seeds and other uh, things like that, that that are attractive to other animals. So we've actually found evidence of, I think, a couple dozen species of animals foraging at raccoon latrines, especially at night for the food material there, the seeds especially. And all that is contaminated since it's feces and it's going to contain the Bayosaskris eggs. And so that's how a lot of these animals are, are picking it up. But it's it's basically accidental ingestion of the eggs from any area contaminated uh, by raccoons. Okay. Well, I'm speaking to Dr. Kevin Kazakis. He's Kazakis, yeah. Kazakis. He's a professor emeritus of veterinary parasitology at the Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine, and we are talking about the raccoon roundworm, Bayless ascaris. Um, now, we talked a little bit about the, the raccoon latrine. Um, if there's anything else you would like to add to your uh, description already, and, and how would somebody like me or my neighbor uh, recognize a raccoon latrine? And where are they well, found? I mean, they're not okay. necessarily always on the ground, but they could be all kinds of places, right? Well, it's a very important thing because uh, people need to recognize them, especially if they're in their yard. Raccoons will pick areas and they'll uh, establish a latrine and then it'll be used by other raccoons. Also, um, they tend to like horizontal surfaces, raised horizontal surfaces, so in, in woodlots, like in the Midwest, you'll find raccoon latrines on fallen trees, on logs. You'll find them on large rocks or debris piles, um, those sorts of things. They'll be up in the crotch of a tree or on a big tree limb. Um, they also like to form latrines on roof rooftops, like uh, sheds or garage roofs or um, the roof of a house, something like that. We've also seen them forming uh, latrines in people's garages in, or in the attic of a home. So it, they, they kind of pick this horizontal area, frequently raised a little bit or, or a lot, and then they will uh, uh, go back to that site and defecate. So their, their feces accumulates there. And how do you recognize one? Well, you find this accumulation of feces, say, 
It could be at the base of a tree. It could be on a debris pile or uh, in the corner of a yard. And the the feces itself of a raccoon is kind of like a cross between a dog and a cat in size. It's tubular. Uh, it's usually dark in color, it's got hair in it, and it's kind of got a pungent odor. You'll frequently see seed material or other material, whatever they've been eating, uh, in it. But uh, most other animals actually don't use latrines, like, you know, cats and dogs are kind of indiscriminate defecators. Um, so if you see an accumulation of that type of feces in the yard uh, or on the shed roof or something like that, then you're probably dealing with a raccoon. So it should be pretty obvious. That's what you're saying. Yep. And yep. Um, if you do have one on your roof, for example, and you have a nice rainstorm, those eggs are going to come down to the ground, no? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we've actually seen that as a problem directly in, in a lot of the disease outbreaks I've dealt with. Uh, for example, in zoos, We'll have raccoon latrines up on top of animal enclosures, and the eggs and feces will kind of rain down into where the animals are, and then they'll become uh, exposed to it. And um, we've actually seen uh, a couple cases in uh, uh, little infant children where uh, it was pretty obvious that the feces was coming off of a roof. One child in Southern California, the, the roof of a daycare facility was actually contaminated so all the feces was washing down into actually into the infant and toddler play area. Oh my gosh! Getting into the soil there where the little kids were playing, and uh, and this little guy uh, contracted it. Wow! All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about the actual disease in uh, humans and mammals, other mammals, and um, mm-hmm. and birds. And there's, I'm getting close to the half point, so I, I'll um, mm-hmm. I may have to cut you off, uh, Doctor Kazakos. Um, there's three types of, uh, they call it larva migraines. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to let the audience know, this is merely a description of a parasitic disease that involves the migration of the immature larva worms throughout the, the host. And um, first there's the neural larva migraines. Can you talk about that and how serious it can be? Mm-hmm. Well, larva migraines in general is just migration in the internal organs. And with Bayless ascaris, they will migrate through the the viscera, like the liver and lungs, but then a low percentage will end up in the nervous system. And that's the most serious form because you get a lot of damage and inflammation in the brain and spinal cord, and so it's going to produce obvious clinical disease. Um, ocular larva migraines, larvae accidentally migrate into the eye. Again, internal migration Usually it's only one larva that enters the eye, but that's enough to cause very serious ocular disease. And those are the two forms we usually associate with uh, the raccoon roundworm. Uh, There's another kind called visceral larva migraines. It's more associated with the dog and cat roundworm because they kind of hang around in the liver and lungs more. Um, But the raccoon roundworm doesn't tend to do that, so we don't see that as often. Okay, so there's not a a lot of cases of... Um, human pathology from the larva attacking areas other than the brain and the eyes? Usually it's the brain and the eyes with yeah. the raccoon asteroid. Now, they are going to migrate through the liver and lungs, and so you will see lesions there. And the larvae can actually go to about any tissue of the body, so microscopically we see that too. But clinically, it's usually neural disease or ocular disease. So uh, the heart the heart is not typically an issue? Uh, the heart can be affected by larvae, sure. and you can get migration through the heart and actually encapsulation in and on the heart. And um, there was actually one fatality in a, in a young man due to a, a huge eosinophilic granuloma in his heart wow. that contained larval fragments that were tentatively identified as Bale's ascaris. And so... Um, that's kind of an unusual case. Usually it's brain involvement or eye involvement. Okay. All right. We're at the halfway point. Um, I'm talking to Dr. Kevin Kazakos, and we'll be back after the break, and we'll be talking more about the raccoon roundworm, Bayless Ascaris. And I encourage you to check out the website, outbreaknewstoday.com, outbreaknewstoday.com. Hang on there for a few minutes.
Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Welcome back to the program. Uh, today I got a very special show with a very special guest. And I'm talking to Dr. Kevin Kazakis, uh, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Parasitology at the Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine. And we're talking about Bayless Ascaris uh, procyanus, or the raccoon roundworm. And we're, we've gone over a whole bunch of different topics. And we're going to start out the second half. Um, we've been talking about the egg, Dr. Kazakis, and um, that's the, the infective um, part of this parasite. And uh, what's the infective dose to cause infection in a human being, for example? Well, actually, this is a dose-related disease because if you're infected with one egg and that larva penetrates, you're infected. But one larva won't do much unless it goes to the eye. So the more eggs that are ingested, the worse the problem is. But there isn't there isn't really kind of an infective dose like you would see with viruses or bacteria, and it's all related to how many eggs are ingested. Does that make sense? Yes, it sure does. Mm-hmm. And I, I would, I, I mean, you, you said that an ocular infection, one larva could cause disease. Yes. Um, but I, I would imagine it would also depend on the size of the brain. Uh, a human, say, compared to an ostrich, you know, much less, well, m- much less larva would be required to cause neural. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely right. The larger the brain, the more larvae entering the brain. To cause trouble, we we figure about five to seven percent of larvae end up in the brain, and they're doing that by accident because they're not really neurotropic as such. They don't go to the brain on purpose. So just by way of the circulation, they end up there. But if it's say a mouse or a small bird, if one larva gets in the brain, that's a fatal infection. Sure. But as you get up into bigger animals, including humans, it may take hundreds or thousands of larvae in the brain to cause a serious disease. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, continue on that discussion of human infections. And okay. uh, w- when was uh, Bayless Ascaris procyanus first recognized as a human pathogen? Because this, yes. this is considered a zoonotic infection. Yes, it is. And uh, the first human cases were actually identified in the early 80s. Um, the first neurologic case in, uh, came to light in 1980 and ocular cases shortly thereafter. Um, But actually, cases were seen before that. They just didn't know what they were dealing with. So we've got cases going all the way back to the 1940s, 1960s, that uh, later on were surmised to be Bayless Asterisk. So it's an interesting situation. Sure. Now, how how many um, confirmed, documented, uh, neurological larval migraines cases are known in humans? We've got about three dozen published cases now, um, but I know of an additional probably a couple dozen more and because uh, not all of them get published in, uh, in about the same number of ocular cases. So they separate out of pretty close to one another. But why, why do you say that some of them don't get published? What does that mean? Well, when a lot of cases of a disease get published, then uh, sometimes the journals say, well, this is just another case of that. It's already been described. Unless there's something unique about that case, then they they may be reluctant to publish it as another case report of the same thing. So uh, that's part of the issue. And uh, the other issue is uh, sometimes uh, physicians see the cases deal with the patients, but they don't really follow up to get them published. So so when uh, Bayless Ascaris was first recognized as a human pathogen, was there a lot of um, uh, resistance from the medical community? There was some, um, mm-hmm. mainly on the ocular side, because this was actually proposed as a human disease based on the size of larvae they were seeing in the eye. And uh, we actually proposed it to, to the ophthalmology community. It didn't. It wasn't received um, that well at the time because they didn't think these people could be exposed to raccoons uh, because a lot of them were in uh, large cities. 
But subsequent to that, that's all changed, and uh, there's plenty of evidence that people even in downtown New York City and lower Manhattan are infected with it, just like anybody else would be. So um, the whole thing has changed now. Yeah. Now, um, a, a good portion of the human cases occur in the very in very young children that are playing in their backyard or doing whatever, yes. and mm-hmm. and even a large portion of that population. Uh, based on my reading, seem to have developmental issues, uh, disabilities of some sort. Um, why is there a, why is the risk higher in these groups, the very young and the development, developmentally disabled? Um, it just goes purely straight to behavior. When you're looking at the, how the people are getting infected, it's ingestion of the eggs from usually soil or raccoon latrines. So you have to have people putting soil in their mouth or raccoon feces. Now, little children, say under the age of two, they're going to do that because everything goes in their mouth, sure. their, their toys, their hands. As you get a little older, people hopefully are learning not to do that anymore, and they're going to be washing their hands instead. However, if you've got children with developmental disabilities, they're going to have altered behavior just because of their developmental disability. And so what we've seen is even teenagers with developmental disabilities in group homes can be exposed to this and become infected because they act like infants. They'll eat sand out of the sandbox. They'll eat soil. They'll put other things in their mouth. And we've actually seen that in a couple of adult people, too. Yeah, and and there's there's a a few uh, uh, human cases that I read about. I'd like to just talk to you and see if you could uh, shed any additional information on it. And okay. one was in 1984. It was a it was a boy with Down syndrome. I think mm-hmm. he was about 18 months old, and he contracted a fatal infection. He was chewing on firewood bark. Yes. And I think I read that there was I mean so many eggs were ingested that at autopsy they found I don't know 3,500 larvae in his brain. Um, are you familiar with this case? And can you t- talk any more about that? Oh, absolutely. That was one of the early cases we worked on. That was the second uh, known human fatality that occurred in northern Illinois. This was a little child that was actually infected in his home. Actually, the first two kids, you'd think they'd be outside in the yard getting infected, but no, these kids were infected within the home. Uh, one guy in, in Pennsylvania got into fireplaces where raccoons were danning mm-hmm. and contaminating the fireplace boxes. I mean, the boy in Illinois, they brought the firewood into the home. And as we mentioned way back when, um, raccoon latrines were frequently found on fallen timber, big logs. And that's what they were cutting for firewood. So when they brought that into the home, the bark was contaminated on on these pieces of firewood. And as these pieces of bark would fall on the floor, and they became available to the child to pick up and put in his mouth. And uh, he actually ingested a large number of eggs. And uh, you were right; he had uh, he had over 3,200 larvae in his brain, okay. which, and that's as I said, only five to seven percent. So you can see he took in, and we estimated uh, eighty to 100,000 eggs orally. Yeah. So, so getting 3,200 larvae in the brain—that's in your estimation—that that's that's, that's, that's going to be a fatal case. That's absolutely severe. That's a severe infection. But actually what we found subsequent to that in all of our work is that that's well within the realm of ingestion uh, by any little child because going back to what we talked about earlier, if raccoon feces contains on average 26,000 eggs per gram and a child, say, ingests 10 grams, that right there is over a quarter of a million eggs. Wow. And frequently it'll have more than that even. So it doesn't take much feces to be ingested by a little child, and they're in a serious situation. Yeah. Now, there was another case. It was, I think, in the year 2000. There was a – this was this case happened to be a teenage boy, maybe about 17, and he had a developmental disability, and he was mm-hmm. eating out of a contaminated sandbox. Uh, I think yep. you kind of already referred to this case maybe, but, mm-hmm. yeah, is there anything you can add to that one? That's um, – well. He was in a very good group home for developmentally disabled uh, people, well taken care of. Uh, It was a nice place. However, it was in a suburb of a city where there was a lot of raccoons. And what city doesn't have a lot of raccoons? And the raccoons had established a latrine uh, in the sandbox and several other parts of the yard 
and it's just because of his disability and his behavior, uh, he would ingest large quantities of sand, so he took in large quantities of eggs. He was actually admitted to the hospital in a coma. That's how bad he was. Wow. And he never he never came out of the coma, and he he died subsequently. Now, this, that, that I mean, st- stories like these have got to scare parents mm-hmm. to death. I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, ooh, I, I, I mean, I mean, I grew up with a sandbox. I I grew up in Syracuse, New York, and we had gazillions of uh, raccoons, and never thought. Guess where, guess where I grew up? Syracuse, New York. Did you really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we did have a lot of raccoons. Yes, sir. And this is why when I'm out talking about these things, I tell people you need a sandbox with a cover and because animals will get in at night and, and defecate there. Uh, cats, raccoons, you don't know. Right, right. Yeah, and then, then there are other parasites to be concerned about, too, when you're talking Absolutely. about dogs yep. and cats. Um, I also read about a case, and it, 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 it seems like it was linked to a person – who was under the influence of drugs, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, is, is drug use uh, linked to eating things you shouldn't well, be eating? Well, it could be because they are going to have altered behavior. This was in a, a young man who was, would go camping with his friends and they were you know, doing some drugs and whatever. So who knows what they got into or what they tried to cook or what they tried to eat. And, um, and he became infected uh, um, so whatever whatever will alter a person's behavior such that they will eat things off the ground or put strange things in their mouth, they could potentially become infected. Um, and the last um, case I wanted to talk about was actually pretty recent. It was a 63-year-old man from California who was doing some work under a house, mm-hmm. and apparently there were raccoons and raccoon species under there at some point. Mm-hmm. He finished his work, got out, ate his lunch, and did not wash his hands. And yep. uh, he, he, uh, I think he survived, but he's he's he was in pretty rough shape, right? He was in very rough shape. He uh, he developed severe neurologic disease, but uh, bounced out of it with treatment and and did better. Um, I don't think he's out of the woods yet, but he he did do better. Um, so it really just depends on where the raccoon feces occur, where the latrines are, and how you're exposed to that. I worry about people finding latrines in their garage or their attic, for example, and trying to clean up the material, uh, you know, without taking proper precautions or, or worrying about it too much. And so uh, hand washing is probably our number one Absolutely. prevention for lots of infectious agents. Especially that one. Okay. And um, you, you, you mentioned that there's been outbreaks in zoos and other places where there are wild animals because they make their latrines in, in all yep. kinds of places. And it was interesting. Yep. I, I the, the outbreak that caught my eye was there was an outbreak in quails, and mm-hmm. like 600 and something quails died. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about that story real quick? Yeah, most of the animal cases like that are all very common. They're either using contaminated feed uh, what the raccoons have gotten in and contaminated the feed, or they're using hay or straw to bed the animals, and that's contaminated because we frequently see latrines in barns uh, in the hayloft. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes the raccoons are just getting into the pens and, and defecating in there. Um, and uh, in that situation, um, and many others like it, uh, the raccoons were basically... Um, getting their feces into the pen through the feed uh, and the hay. So, so in the case of the quails, the, these eggs just probably fell to the ground. The quails ate. They eat off the ground. Sure, and, and, and uh, one larva yeah. is enough for the. Yeah, larva. we actually dealt with another one in quail where a guy had a couple pet raccoons. He raised them in this big pen and later took them out and put them in another enclosure, and then he turned about, I don't know how many quail, into that pen uh, several months later, and the eggs were still in there, and all the quail died. They had a 100% kill of all the quail with severe neurologic disease. And uh, we estimated, even with low-level shedding, that pen was contaminated with about 155 million eggs. Holy cow. So... Yeah. This is how animals are picking it up. We've actually seen in, in zoos uh, 
wide variety of zoo species affected uh, different birds, uh, 24 species of primates in zoos. So it's a common problem in zoos because they're overrun with raccoons at night because of all the animal feed and such. Right. And there's so there's not a lot the zoos can do about that, I guess. It's just... It's, well, they try to control the raccoons. They they trap them and relocate them. Yeah. They, they're actually trying to treat them now, the wild populations, with anhelmintic drugs to try to lower the prevalence, uh, you know, in their stable population. So there's a few, and plus they have to be on the lookout for the latrines, like we talked about, right, right. clean those up. All right, let, let's talk about something that a lot of listeners may be interested in, and what about the risk for common household pets like dogs and cats? That's a good question. Um, we've seen fatal neurologic disease due to this in dogs. We've seen nothing in cats so far. I always say so far because that 150 species we talked about didn't get there, you know, all at once. Right. It came on slowly. So, so far we've not seen anything in cats. I don't know if they're more resistant or if they're just cleaner, but, you know, they're going to pick up eggs too through grooming. But we have seen that dogs can be killed by it. Uh, and the other thing with dogs, uh, which is even more interesting to me, is that dogs can actually serve as a definitive host for the raccoon astrid. And some dogs actually develop adults. We've seen probably a couple dozen dogs now that are actually infected with the adults. And it's the dog that's shedding the eggs of the oh parasite, oh. not the raccoon. So it could be your pet dog in your yard contaminating the yard with the raccoon roundworm eggs. I've, I've dealt with a number of dogs that have had dual infections with Toxicara and Bayless Asterisk. So would, would um, the the normal deworming medications that you get from your vet uh, take care of something like that? Absolutely. They work very well. They'll remove the uh, raccoon roundworm just like the dog roundworm. And uh, we're recommending they you know keep their dog on those monthly heartworm preventives sure. because they're, they'll do a good job in removing these parasites uh, right. monthly. Right. And how about the, 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 the pets dragging eggs into the house on their fur, on their paws? Um, is that, that's is that, always a possibility. Yeah. If, if you live where raccoons occur and you're walking outside, um, you could do it yourself too. So dogs, yeah. cats could bring it in, but you could bring in a few on your shoes. The numbers of eggs brought in like that are probably not going to be that great. And, uh, but it's possible. Um, we worry more about little kids actually getting into heavily contaminated sites sure. like, you know, the latrine, uh, where there's many more eggs. But, you know, it behooves us to be careful, you know, bathe our pets and do good vacuuming and, uh, you know, cleaning of shoes and all of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I thought I read of a case, too, where uh, a young child was actually chewing on a shoe. That's right. This child it was a little child, and his part of his behavior that he would lick the bottoms of family members' shoes when they took their shoes off. Oh my That's just what he did, and uh, he got infected. And uh, we don't know if that's how he got infected. We actually think he got infected out in the yard. Um, but uh, you're right. I mean, little little children, you know, two year olds, they'll do strange things. I, I, I'm sorry to my audience if I'm scaring parents out there, but uh, this is something I think you need to know about. Well, it's something they need to be aware of. Yeah. So they can take the simple precautions needed to prevent getting into the situation. Right. Now, and it is pretty simple. Yes, sir. Um, now, asymptomatic infections. Asymptomatic for my audience means you, you are not showing any symptoms. Is there such a thing with Bayless Ascaris? Yes. Um, most cases are probably asymptomatic infections because there's probably a, a lot, well, we know there's a lot more people infected that don't show clinical signs because they either don't have enough larvae migrating or not enough have gone to the brain and none have gone to the eye. Yeah. So they don't develop clinical disease usually. Now, there's another type called covert infection where they actually manifest some nonspecific signs. Um, from low-level infection, they may develop an eosinophilia or something like that or a cough, but they're, they're so nonspecific that nobody's going to be able to diagnose it properly. All right. All right, Dr. Kazakos, let's talk about disease prevention and control. Okay. What, what, what can the average homeowner do 
uh, to take care of a, a, a problem like a raccoon latrine? Well, I think the most important thing, especially if they got little children in the household, is education and awareness. Um, recognizing those latrines and teaching the little kids what they look like and to stay away from them, don't play in those areas, because little children actually find those pretty attractive because of all the stuff there. Um, hand washing is very important, um, especially if they have pets or, you know, go outside and play in the soil. If they actually find a latrine, they can clean that up and disinfect it by um, basically just putting gloves on and, and, and maybe just a painter's mask, a particulate mask, and just kind of gently cleaning up that feces and bagging it and putting it in the trash. Then I would go back and hit the same area with heat, uh, either a steam gun or, or burn the area off or something like that to kill any residual eggs. We actually found plain old boiling water from a teapot works very good. Okay. Um, because uh, sometimes you see latrines established on people's porches or, or decks, and, and that's a good way to decontaminate. Okay. So uh, going out there with a propane torch, you're, that's that's an option. But That does work, but, and people can get those for burning weeds and such, and, yeah. and that will that will work too. Amazing. Okay. Now, now we talk about attics. I just mentioned that because raccoons get into people's attics yeah. and establish latrines up there. What we found on those sort of situations is just to close it up so the raccoons can't get up there anymore, leave it alone, and in a matter of seven or eight months, all the eggs will die from desiccation, and then you can clean it up, and it's no risk at all. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, they'll, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll just dry out up there. They dry out. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I got about two minutes left, Dr. Kazakis. Um, okay. Talk about diagnosis and treatment. Uh, First of all, are physicians trained and attuned to recognizing this uh, serious disease? Unfortunately, no. The average physician is kind of woefully trained in zoonoses and parasitology both. So it's really not in their curriculum, usually in medical school. But where you do see better training is uh, ophthalmologists, infectious disease specialists, who may be called in on a case, but if the average physician can recognize that a child has an eosinophilia um, and put it two and two together that they may have a parasite infection, call in an ID specialist who you know might be more aware of Bayless asterisk, then then they may uh, be ahead of the game. Okay, and real quickly, can you talk? Um quickly about diagnostic testing available and yes. tr- treatment. Diagnostic testing, uh, routine blood work, uh, we look for eosinophil changes. And if uh, something is suspected, we actually have very good serology for this now. So uh, uh, besides finding eosinophils in the blood or cerebrospinal fluid, they can send a serum sample to CDC and actually look for antibodies using either ELISA testing or Western blotting. So if we diagnose a case or a case is suspected, um, the best treatment regimen is to start the person as soon as possible on a course of albendazole, and uh, usually at least 10 days. And um, uh, when children are affected with uh, neurologic disease, uh, they may be on albendazole for a month or so. Um, un- unfortunately, though, there's a lag time in the development of disease. So by the time a diagnosis is made, it's very hard to get ahead of it sometimes unless it's not a heavy case. So even with albendazole treatment, they may not turn around well. All right. And that's it's, an sorry. important consideration. Excellent. Dr. Kevin Kazakis, thank you, sir, for your time and expertise in this incredibly comprehensive interview. I appreciate it so much, sir. Thank you. Very, very much a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, sir. Okay. And, uh, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Kevin Kazakis. I want to thank Ace for running the controls, and I want to thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you next week on Outbreak News This Week. Good night, and God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.